Welcome to the Dead Pixel Society podcast, the photo imaging industry's leading news source. Here's your host, Gary Peugeot. The Dead Pixel Society podcast is brought to you by Media Clip, Advertech Printing, and IP Labs. Hello again, and welcome to the Dead Pixel Society podcast. I'm your host, Gary Peugeot, and today we're joined by Hans Hartman, the chairman of Visual First, which is the leading executive level conference for the imaging industry. Hi, Hans. How are you today? I'm doing well. How are you? Doing great, Hans. Always great to see you. First, let's talk about some of the trends that are happening in the tech side of the industry. Because at last year's Visual First Conference, kind of generative AI broke out into the high-level awareness for most people in the industry. It kind of had been burbling under the service. I mean, AI and imaging, is, I don't have to tell you, has been around in some form or another for quite some time, actually. But it, this generative side a, burst forward. And then soon after that, it broke out into the general uh, business media and people started talking about it. So for those who have somehow been under a rock for the last year or so, can you say what is generative AI and maybe some of the leaders in that space so people can understand it? Yeah, well, maybe take one step back. So AI in general, and generative AI is part of it. So AI in general is a way to make connections between sort of annotated human annotated data for instance you, you can have humans to say hey wait, these are photos they have a ball in it so i'm annotating a ball so you get a training set yeah. of human created content or at least human con you know annotated content mm -hmm. that's fed into a neural network system and that then outputs it learns the statistical relationships between that say in this case an image and what's in that image and then it outputs it to large and large numbers of uh, images or photo or, or videos etc and makes it very very easy to um, make connections at scale whether that is image um, recognition or uh, you know uh, workflow automation it's all about learning something with a limited set of data and then extrapolating so you can use it for other data. So how is that different from, from uh, sort of you know, traditional programming? Uh, it's basically a black box. We don't even know how that AI system defines that there is a ball in an image. You can also not modify right. uh, the, the, you know, the learnings from that AI system. Right. You just throw a lot of data into it. And basically, it exports a lot of other data, and, and you can do that at scale and very finite. Mm -hmm. So that's AI in general. Mm -hmm. And in our industry, I mean, we, we've had at our conference of very early on innovators uh, six, seven years ago, um, where the main use case was image recognition. Right. Yeah, again, telling what is in photos. So instead of doing that manually through metadata, you can automatically know what is in the name it so that's a well understood so for example it may see there's a face and then later on it knows who that person is and may ascribe a tag to that face that would be an exactly. example of that exactly without a human needing to write down this this is gary in that face or whatever all right so then the, the new kid on the block and that's really relatively new maybe a year year and a half uh, at this point is generative ai and that is some form of it where also things are done automatically as a black box, but it is basically um, you have a prompt and it could be a text, or it could be a photo, it could even be a video. So you have a specific prompt that goes into the AI system and then the AI system also having learned these things through training sets, then outputs in a particular uh, uh, media format. Mm -hmm. So. Classic example uh, is, you know, you have text like describe whatever, a dog walking on the beach on two legs or so, some crazy text. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the text is the prompt. The output is a photo um, that shows that dog walking. On two and legs that's on being created by the AI. There's, it's not going out and yeah. finding a stock photo of a dog and putting it in a beach picture, it's actually creating that. So you yep. may not know what the dog 
you haven't specified the dog's color, so it could be a black dog, could be a white dog, could be a tan dog, could be a Great Dane, could be a poodle. You have no idea unless you specify it in the prompt. Correct. Yeah. So it, you create original output based on a specific prompt. Mm -hmm. Now, the interesting thing, it doesn't have to be text as the input prompt and a photo as the output prompt. It could also be a photo. Mm. Yeah, and an existing real photo that is a prompt and that is then turned into another photo or it can even be turned into an animation or a video so a photo could even be a prompt to create text mm. or a video for instance could also be a prompt to create other videos could be a video that creates photos mm -hmm. could be a video that creates text you know transcriptions is a, is a, is a very good uh, example of that mm -hmm. so you have all these prompts for input and all these output media types mm -hmm. and the beauty of it is it can be done you know very very easily and you can do it at scale so you can have whatever 500 versions of a sweater so you you make a prompt uh, maybe a photo of a sweater in an e-commerce situation, you're going to have 500 variations with different colors, different sizes by, by specifying additional prompts to that, that image. So mm. there, there's a lot of scalability uh, advantages and also ways to make tweaks to a single photo or video for specific segments or specific use cases. Mm -hmm. So you can have customized marketing, segmented marketing, even personalized marketing, for instance. Mm -hmm. So theoretically, an ad being shown to someone could be an AI image of a product that doesn't exist yet until the yeah. consumer orders it, and then it could be produced. And yeah. it's it's being shown because the AI knows, you know, I'm a middle-aged man, and I like the Detroit Lions, so it's going to create a jersey that... Yeah. I might might appeal to me. Yeah, yeah. So it could have turned that knowledge that comes from a database or whatever way that mm -hmm. it knows who you are, middle-aged man, <laughs> bold in your case. <laughs> hey, it, it knows that and that becomes the text prompt. He needs a hat. Is what he so. needs to protect his bald head. It's a hat. That's what he needs. You can add that to it in the, in the AI. That's not a problem. There you yeah. go. So... Everyone's heard, obviously, if they've been watching anything in the news, the 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 scary stories about chat GPT. But what are some of the ones in the imaging world that are creating some of this generative content? Yeah, well, there, there, there are a bunch of them. Uh, you know, uh, open AI, stability AI, a lot of uh, photo and video app developers use stability AI mm -hmm. because they have, uh, you know, mm -hmm open ways of uh, using their technology mid journey is probably on the high end side of things yep. creating really nice images mm -hmm. and then even a company like adobe with firefly which You're is right, right. i was going to mention also, them yep yeah that's also being productized in photoshop and other uh, adobe products mm -hmm. there that, that in itself is a very interesting initiative because you can combine traditional photo editing capabilities with generative AI aspects in it in the same application, in this right. case Photoshop. Or, so yeah, so you have an existing photo, you know, maybe maybe the, the, it was zoomed in too far, you want a little bit more of the, the background beats on there, and then they call it generative expand, other people call it uh, uh, what is it, decropping or outpainting is what, what uh, uh, open AI uh, calls it. So the different ways of saying it, but you know, you add a generative aspect to it mm -hmm. where the input prompt is the photo right? and you let it expand on that. I think the two two takeaways of what Adobe is doing with Firefly. One is it's a very innovative way of combining traditional photo editing capabilities with sure. generative um, uh, AI cre uh, image creation mm -hmm. or editing. The, yeah, I think the second part, uh, there is, is interesting that, uh, you know, an Adobe ghost is round uh, and is not afraid of, uh, uh, you know, a setback by traditional photographers. So right. they're very keen on also identifying that that image was created uh, using generative AI in the metadata. So they're really on the forefront of trying to protect 
the digital rights of their, their users. Because that's one of the things that has come up is some of the ethical concerns regarding AI-generated images. Uh, I think recently a judge has determined that uh, an AI-generated images can't be copyrighted, right? Because right. it's not owned by an image. And then, but I think it also kind of goes back to some of the early discussions about image manipulation. I remember, you know, I'm dating myself here, but going back when, you know, 1992, going to a conference with the National Press Association, they were trying to determine, you know, the ethics of editing an image at yeah. all digital. Mm -hmm. And there yeah. was a question of you couldn't do it in the dark room, you shouldn't do it on the computer. And yeah. now go to today when you have, you know, purely uh, generated images being presented as news items, you know, maybe a certain former president running from the police. I've seen yep. everyone's seen that image. So I, I think for, as, a, as, a, as a society, as a culture, we sort of, uh, you know, recognize it's coming and banning it, restricting it won't go anywhere. It's just a matter of putting pl things in place like what Adobe is doing to use it ethically. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of, well, there's, there's sort of two, two aspects of, I call it the flip sides of AI. So one is you alluded to earlier with um, the latest um, having a judge sort of reiterate what the uh, uh, Copyright uh, Bureau already had uh, claimed in the past that only humans can produce work that can be copyrighted. You you cannot give a copyright to an application or to technology. So mm -hmm. anyway, so the, there's one aspect to it is the digital rights of the folks who provided the content. So mm -hmm. AI systems, like I said, they use training sets. They can learn from content. Right. Uh, and if you have a very particular identifiable style of your content, you're an artist or you're a photographer in a certain way, mm -hmm. that AI can create very, very similar images in that same style. And sure. immediately say, hey, there goes Hans's, uh, if I were Van Gogh, yeah. <laughs> that goes Hans's Van Gogh uh, yeah. photo there. So this yeah. identifiable uh it, it you know it, it it's very understandable that the photographer or the artist uh, mm -hmm. is concerned about the digital rights and sure. they're not fully protected right now. But also there's the question of the data sets being used. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 if my work is being used in a training set, then that system can use the kind of work that I do. Right. Now, where it gets really complicated is often these training sets, they, they, they crawl the entire internet and they might have like, millions of variations of a similar in of a particular kind of image so so my aim if i'm not that unique as a photographer or right. artist i'm one of the ones who one of the million who provided my uh, my my image to the training set un unknowingly but you know what that it's very hard then to say that AI system benefited specifically from your work. So right. it, it is very complicated legal, legal, legal thing. So that, that's in essence, you know, that there's one set of concern is these digital rights yeah. and then there are initiatives to um, uh, make sure that you, uh, you know, you can have invisible watermarks, you can have your metadata and, and we had the, the industry initiatives to um, encourage mm -hmm. the AI systems to require to automatically have that metadata so you know it was an artificial mm -hmm. uh, image, but you know, no, always bad. It, it's very hard. First of all, that's not implemented yet mm -hmm. by everybody. And even if the big guys do it now, there, there will be guys around the corner who will not do it. So it, yeah. it's all very complicated. Yeah, exactly. Because I know some news on. organizations settled on the phrase like photo illustration, for example, or something yeah. like that to denote that this is not an actual depiction of a real life event. It's an illustration that looks photographic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So last year, when we sort of had the first major discussion about generative AI at our conference, we also had a panel that uh, included folks from the Content Authenticity Initiative, yeah. where Adobe is a, a leading uh, participant on that, and they are trying to get at least some some industry standards uh, implemented uh, that, that way. So that, that you know, lots of things are 
being discussed now, but it, you know, there's not an easy solution on the horizon to make sure that the digital rights um, are you know foolproof, protected for the for the people who have uh, produced uh, their work. Then the other the other topic related to the flip side is then really misleading content like you said you know one of the former president uh, you know taken into uh, custody in a, in a particular kind of way or I, I showed at another conference lots of photos of the pope in, in down jackets and on the exactly. Harley Davidson driving yeah exactly and you couldn't tell if that was true or not uh, so deep fakes is not so much because it rips off somebody's artistic work, but it is really misleading, mm -hmm. uh, and it can yeah you know, can be fun and you know, like nobody's really thinking. I hope <laughs> that that Pope is indeed <laughs> about to take off in a polo jacket on on his Harley Davidson. But right. uh, uh, so it can be can be fun. It, deep fakes. In a way, you know, it could be creative, but mm -hmm. definitely it can be misleading also. So sure. uh, having a way to force either the systems to proactively let people know this was artificially created or having a way retroactively having technology mm -hmm. that can sort of detect whether something was created by AI or not. The, the, you know, lots of initiatives now to at least get get a handle on the deep fakes issue, but that's also an issue. Mm -hmm. And in the big scheme of things, maybe, maybe one last thing, in the big scheme of things, I mean, it's the incredible pluses about generative AI. Oh, sure. Like I indicated earlier, the creativity, uh, for e-commerce doing things at scale anybody can do things now you don't have to you know go three years of training I mean, there are lots and lots of productivity efficiency creative mm -hmm. creative advantages uh but there are yeah. also these pretty strong negatives mm -hmm. that we're trying to mitigate uh either through legal action or through technologies or through uh standards being issued right you know yeah. you said there's groups that are formed to try and you know develop standards that people can adhere to to at least prevent clear information and and not inaccurate or misleading information yeah, yeah. so that was sort of last year's thing which <laughs> is still this year's thing but moving forward you've got the upcoming visual first conference coming up uh for those who aren't aware of it, which I'm be surprised if anyone in my audience isn't, but for the for the three people who are not, uh, what is Visual First? Where is Visual First? And when is Visual First? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's an annual conference. Uh, it will be the eleventh edition this year. It's a day and a half program. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the afternoon of October twenty fourth, all day on October twenty fifth. And we're bringing together, say, 175 to 200 uh, sort of leaders of the industry together with very innovative startups. And they're literally from all over the world. So last year, about 40% of the attendees were from outside the US. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, you, you can have a interesting connections being made at the conference between a CEO of what is a unicorn or a public company mm -hmm. sitting next to a startup mm -hmm. uh, founder who the startup of two people there so it's a very interesting bringing together it's all focused on the photo and video industry mm -hmm. uh, we have a special sort of pre-conference uh, activity of women in imaging lunch so mm. because we really encourage the women also to have some extra level of networking amongst each other so mm. it happens right before the conference starts mm. and then both uh, days of the conference we also have receptions at the end of the program mm. these days so it's a lot of networking but uh, we're very proud of also having a, a fabulous lineup of speakers mm -hmm. and just to wrap that up so we have so three or four different kind of activities at the conference. Mm -hmm. So one is we have, well, first of all, maybe maybe fifth one. There's a keynote, which will be this year myself. It's going to be a dual keynote myself with uh, my partner, Alexis Girard. Mm -hmm. We'll also discuss AI, but, but sort of try to 
extract from historical lessons what have been mm -hmm. revolutionary moments in the world of photography mm -hmm. what can we learn from that going forward what's happening now with ai so mm -hmm. we're, we're taking a little bit looking back but with the aim of understanding what might or might not uh, happen in the in the coming year so we that's a dual keynote as we, we're going to do it a little bit back and forth mm -hmm. Then we have uh, oh, uh, just, just a little bit. What is uh, for those folks who don't know? Alexi, I mean, I, we assume everyone knows Alexi, but for those who don't know Alexi, uh, he is probably one of the pioneers in digital imaging. Can you talk a little bit about his background? Yeah, yeah. So he was in the past the founder of uh, Future Future Image, and there was a conference called uh, Six Sight, mm -hmm. which eventually became part of PMA. Mm -hmm. As you know, what PMA is having worked there for many many years, uh, yeah. Gary. He also is a very talented uh, photographer, which is maybe not as well as well known. Uh, he made uh, he had a couple of books, mm -hmm. uh, one about Napoleon, a, a, a really a great coffee table photo book uh, that came out. Was it a year, two years ago after the X number of years after uh, Napoleon has died? And he was also the founder of DIG, which then turned into a part of the digital media. What is a digital imaging group yeah. that was? also yeah. became part of the PMA conference. So it's a great background. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, we, we uh, complement each other very well that mm -hmm. way. I, I, I might be a little bit more focused on the the, the, the nitty gritty technology right. innovation happening now. He has a fabulous um, vision and perspective on where we are coming from and, and also being a hands-on uh photographer uh that way and mm -hmm. understand that part of the uh the conference so anyway that's a dual keynote <laughs> going mm -hmm. back there uh then we'll have uh for now we might or might not have a fourth one but we'll definitely have three i would say very very interesting uh fireside chat mm -hmm. uh, sessions and that means uh the way we do it it's really a frank discussion with with an innovator of sorts in the industry. Mm -hmm. It's not just a one on one discussion, actually one on two, there's two moderators and one person presenting. So we have the uh, head of engineering for Google Photos, mm -hmm. uh, and he will talk specifically about the not so much the engineering part, but more the strategic choices of right. who to go after with what kind of features for Google Photos right. and have done. You've, probably seen a lot of recent announcements there that they're really on a, on a very fast track and in innovating things. Right, definitely focusing on memory, memory curation, uh, and that sort of technology. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, making your memories come to life. That That's sort of how they do it. It's it's not, you know, here's a pile of, of images and go back and try to find it. Mm -hmm. it, it helps you reconnect with, uh, with your visual memories. Yeah. Um, the, the one that we just signed up, uh, and I'm extremely pleased with having her on board, is uh, Ilka Demir. Mm. And she heads uh, the, uh, what is it called, Intel's Trusted Media Group. Mm. So she is a super duper uh, you know, technologist, uh, and that whole group within Intel is developing all kinds of technologies to do lots of things around AI, but one thing in particular where I think they really stand out with having unique technology is in ways to detect whether an image is a deep fake or not. Mm -hmm. okay. I talked earlier the different ways you can prevent, you can annotate things, you can have a metadata or watermarks. They are developing things that are super, you know, some of it sounds like super complex to actually detect whether uh, images are uh, deep fake or not. Even yeah. looking at blood flow of pixels in 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 uh, in in a sequence of frames in a video, for instance, that that level kind of stuff uh, that mm -hmm. uh, they are developing. So awesome. she will talk about fighting the flip sides of AI with AI, not mm -hmm. not just regulation or metadata or watermarks, that kind of stuff. Right. 
And then the third one, uh, probably a lot of your your uh, listeners uh, know him well, Tim McCain uh, of ImageFix. Um, uh, Tim has a very interesting story, not just having you know uh, built his volume photography technology company, mm -hmm. having sold that, and then the next the company that acquired them was then acquired again by uh, by another company. So they're done well as a business photo entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. But the part that uh, I only recently heard because I was also speaking at the uh, the uh, SPOA, the uh, School Photography Association conference where mm -hmm. Tim shared that he actually has a whole initiative to help homeless kids who don't get their school photos as right. you know most other kids uh, get. Mm -hmm. Having a foundation that helps uh, uh, you know right. homeless kids basically also mm -hmm. to get their mementos, the visual mementos. Yeah. So, it's not only that there's an interesting initiative, it's, it's a very interesting coming from him because he was homel homeless in his teenage years. Yeah. So he's really going back to that. And, and we really want to give him a, a, a podium or a stage that. And and he has attended Visual First in the past, as you said. He picked up some oh, yeah. ideas a couple of times. Yeah. So he's been there in the past. You probably see, see some familiar faces. So Yeah, yeah. So those are our three five sites: yeah, Google Photos, uh, then Tim, and then also Intel with the Trusted Media Division. Mm -hmm. uh, then we have four panels, and they um, they will all have they're almost completely filled now. But they they will all have four speakers each, two moderators. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, there will be AI as a topic. One is about uh, very innovative uh, approaches to create images through AI. Mm -hmm. uh, one is about the curation. What is next in how to find that perfect photo using AI? Mm -hmm. Then we have two other panels. One is a stock photography panel that includes uh, you know, the CEO of FreePick. We have Shutterstock. We have Adobe Stock. Mm -hmm. And also every pixel labs from um, they're actually based in Bali, Indonesia. Yep. Very interesting stock photography group because that's an industry that's of course, uh, you know, sort of torn between what's happening with AI and their traditional businesses. So some of sure. them are really innovating at a rapid pace, mm -hmm. instead of sort of, hey, you know, our traditional way of doing things is not going to work, and we, we, you know, sitting on the couch and see that happen. Right. They're really at the forefront of innovating the stock photography world, which is sure. a topic we have never really covered that much at our conference. So I'm very interested in uh, hearing their stories. And then we have, as we uh, typically have, we also have a, a, a panel around innovation in the photo printing market. Mm -hmm. uh, that includes uh, innovative approach with friends about uh, you know how to leverage direct mail and free photos for customers. Mm -hmm. We could sort of go through that. We also have uh, uh, Jordan Moore from Edge Imaging talk about volume photography and how that is sort of making strategic, smart choices about mm -hmm. what to keep digital and how to push or encourage photo printing. And if it's photo printing, what kind of photo print products? So we really, uh, I think there will be a lot of learnings also outside of the school uh, photography market. Yeah, by, uh, I think, yeah, I think that, that uh, they, they'll have broad interest. And then lastly, I think the one part that I think is sort of where people kind of sit up and take notes at the session are the show and tell presentations. Uh, can you talk about what those are? And I don't think yeah. we need to go through like the entire list. No. Because you said <laughs> there's, there's quite a few of them, but kind of yeah. the format so people understand uh it's not just a demo it's it's a, it's almost like a pitch sort of yeah, yeah. uh well, well, well i mean because there's awards <laughs> yeah there, there are we have a, a actually a, maybe start with that we have a very great uh set of judges uh one from the m a the merger acquisition space uh andy calm who was also with uh, amazon and nokia in the past uh so he is a an investment banker focused on exits of startups, mm -hmm. knows a lot about it. We have on the venture capitalist side, Sami Nimi, who was in the past also with Microsoft and Nokia in the, the their photo tools uh, division. 
So he's with Spintop Ventures, which is a Swedish or Sweden-based mm -hmm. um, venture uh, capital firm. And then we have Anna Dixon, uh, who's the group product manager of Google, and she's really in charge of analyzing content and aggregating content for for like Google Maps and, and these kind of um, mm -hmm. uh, things. So the judges basically give four awards, best of show, best technology, best business potential, and then the sort of a special recognition award they can give an award for where they really think for other reasons that a particular mm -hmm. uh, uh, presenter stood out. So the sessions themselves, there are three sessions. Typically, each of these sessions have 10, so there are a total of 30 uh, uh, presenters. And each of them have four minutes sharp, literally sharp because we have a clock, a countdown <laughs> clock, and I kick them off the stage if they go on That's half the fun is watching you kick someone off the stage. <laughs> I know. I go <laughs> just for that. <laughs> <laughs> I know, the audience likes that. Uh, and of course, you know, I do it in, in a gentle way, but uh, gentle but stern. But there's four minutes. It shouldn't be a PowerPoint. It shouldn't be a video. It shouldn't be a pitch. Really, it's it's you yeah. sh you demo why that app is good. It's right. a live demo. But then the audience hears in the words of the presenter themselves. Mm -hmm. That could be, you know, startups is typically the founder. Sometimes it's a larger company. It's a product owner within the company. But they yeah. hear from the horse's mouth, to, so to say, while they are looking at the demo, what is so unique and so innovative about what they're showing there. So we have a, a broad variety, as always, of use cases mm -hmm. being presented in these apps, mm -hmm. um, all the way from photo capture to sharing to editing to video to mm. printing yeah you're right i mean of course you know we, we've alexi and i as conference chairs we we are extremely proud with the lineup of fireside chat and well-known celebrities and panels but these show and tell sessions you know when we do our evaluation they always score the highest because it's so authentic and people remember they mm. they, they remember mm -hmm particular demos that were done three years ago and what that people said because it's a live experience it, they really soak it up so we, we're very uh, happy with that lineup and in some ways this may be the first time some of these uh products are shown and the other side is the only way to experience this content is to go to the event there's no recording or uh presentations available afterwards yeah yeah yeah, and, and that has been the, you know, we often are being asked, why don't you make recordings available? Why don't you stream it? A big chunk of what the conference is all about is making connections and being there live, being in the moment. Uh, and it's sort of like in, in, the, in the old days of when Snapchat came out, I mean, that you, you, you let people share live and you know, you couldn't record it. And if you were not part of it, it was gone. So that's right. how, how we see this. It is very much a live event, uh, con making connections there. Uh, and that's why, like I said, 40%, uh, you know, is coming out from outside the US. They find it worthwhile to travel here. Mm -hmm. uh, this year, we're in particular happy because it's a couple of days, if you're in the printing world and you're going to Printing United, and quite a few of our customers do that, it's just a couple of days after Printing United. So, so a lot of people go there and then continue their travel to San Francisco for our conference. It's also back to back with a conference that's occurring in San Francisco. And that is from the Digital Media Licensing Association. So a lot of folks from the stock photography world from the digital asset management world, they are aggregating there. So quite a few of those will also mm -hmm. either speak or uh, participate at our conference. So we are sort of you know using these partnerships to uh, bring in even more people than, than uh, we would have had otherwise. And let's not forget the possibility of a Dead Pixel Society meetup <laughs> at the visual first we're at a location yet to be determined i know that's going to push people over the edge and they're going to go uh you haven't mentioned the location it's a new location this year can you talk a little bit about fort mason yeah yeah it's first actually the second time we did it i our very like i said we have done 10 uh conferences before this uh, our 11th year and our second 
edition was also at Fort Mason at a different building there. Uh, Fort Mason is it's at the base. So you're literally when you're you're sitting, if you're not distracted by what's happening on the stage, you can just look out the windows and look straight at Alcatraz. It's five minutes walk from Fisherman's Wharf. Uh, but Fort Mason, it's an area of, of former piers with warehouses there, lots of galleries, art uh, nonprofits are there. So it's a, it's a very nice environment to be part of. And we have our own building, which is called the General's Residence, some, some kind of general head at, at his big mansion. Mm -hmm. So we have that whole building uh, and hope, you know, we all hope typically in, in October, the, the weather is nice in San Francisco. But, mm -hmm. It's also a great outdoor uh, area, so we, we hope to be able to do the receptions that's at the outdoors with that view of the bay and and, uh, and, uh, and Alcatraz there. So it, it's, a, nice. it's a lovely place to uh, connect and hang out. Yeah, I've never been to a visual first where the weather wasn't beautiful, so. <laughs> well... <laughs> If you have time for one more anecdote, <laughs> no, please. Yeah, go one year you might remember that uh, it was actually colder than normal, and then however uh, we had it in the past, and the procedure was also an old building. Right, yeah, yeah. The, the venue people said, "Well, why don't we turn on the heat?" Because the poor people sitting near the the had the receptionist uh, with the, the doors open. Why don't we turn on the heat? But having been such an old building it created all kind of smoke and fumes so we had to, <laughs> the, the fire department had to come on here to abandon everybody because it uh, anyway all all a result of uh, it being a little too cold there but normally keep our fingers crossed the, the weather is nice and uh, yeah. enjoyable and so where can someone go for more information about the visual first conference yeah the easiest just go to visualfirst.biz b-i-z and it's the number and one. First is visual number one ST. Uh, and if you type out first, I think it also re reconnects there. But uh, yeah, there you see the program. Don't forget to also go. We we have this year for the first time we have a dedicated bios page mm -hmm. uh, where our panelists advise. I chat. You read a lot more what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an FAQ. There's also hotel information on it, and we have uh, early bird. Uh, ends at the end of the month i believe september 24th september 25th so make sure if you are attending uh, buy a ticket early great well thank you hans uh for the briefing on generative ai and the history and also sharing with us about the visual first conference looking forward to seeing you at fort mason uh next month thank you very much uh, lovely thank you for having me Thank you for listening to the Dead Pixel Society podcast. Read more great stories and sign up for the newsletter at www.thedeadpixelssociety.com.